Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, M&T Bank, Genova Burns. Additional support is provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantil Commerce Bank, Meridian Capital Group, New Banks, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Scranton, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. I want to I wanna be a golf caddy. I really want to play golf. Nah, go to St. Benedict's, Syracuse University. Hmm, maybe, oh, I'll be a, a chef in the Army Reserve. Nah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Chase Manhattan Bank to become a banker. 24 years of age, young vice president. Nah, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to go into business. I'll get involved with a mortgage company. Nah, maybe I'll own some real estate. Nah, that's not even there. Maybe I'll go to work for this Canadian company. I'll get involved with investments. I'll get involved with more aspects of real estate. I'll get on boards of real estate companies. And more important, I'll be a friend of Mike Stoller. <laughs> I have my good friend Tom Lydon, who's the president of the City Investment Fund. Thanks for being here. Well, thanks for inviting me. So tell me about uh, the family, how they originally uh, migrated, and you don't even know from what town in Ireland. Oh, don't. Uh, but they, they went to Scranton, you said. Yeah, well, it, uh, I, on, my, I, on my golf trips to Ireland, I probably should have done some more investigation on where the great-grandparents came from. But uh, they ended up in uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania, home of coal country and the Erie Lackawanna Railroad and... Now, you said great-grandpa was an entrepreneur. He was like a merchant. He had a couple of businesses in Scranton? Yeah, he had a motel business. He had a, uh, a pharmacy business, and he was also a uh, land speculator. So uh, he really kind of was a jack-of-all-trades. I have no idea if he was uh, successful monetarily in it. Now, he had, what, five sons, you said to me? He had Four sons four, and a daughter. And four sons and, and a daughter. And then he owned some land which where the interstate was going. Right. But what happened? Well, Interstate 81 came through uh, 25, 30 years ago. But, and he had land, probably 150 acres, right off of that on a mountain where they ended up building a ski resort and an industrial complex. But the problem is his land of which I went out several times with my father trying to search where the land was on the survey when I was eight and nine years old, was landlocked. So the value of the land never was... Even though it was near the interstate. It never near the interstate, you didn't have access to it. So the great fortune, the potential of the, of the Leidens evaporated. And I think we sold it to a cousin for $100,000. And there were like 25 people now, who got, each got $4,000. Now, now, you said your mother's side came from where? West Pittston, which is really right next to Scranton. Um, again, more They were from Welsh? Well, Welsh's background, yeah, from Wales, but uh, I really didn't know my great-grandfather's or, or her family's background very much. Uh, 
they were very local in nature, stayed local. They didn't work in local jobs. And so how does your father come over here from Scranton? He, it's the war. There are four brothers. He's, he's in the Air Force? Your brother. As my uncle was in the, went into the Air Force and stayed in the Air Force for 40, permit, 40 right. years and still is alive at age 90, uh, living so in Florida. Your uncle, but and your then the other, the other three brothers all came to New Jersey seeking their fortunes because Scranton at that point and the whole coal and industry was going downhill by that time. So they settled in New Jersey and my f one uncle was an accountant. My other uncle was a, uh, um, a lawyer. And then my father became a uh, commercial real estate broker uh, in Newark primarily. Yeah, your father became a, a real estate broker after the war. Correct? After the war. He was in the Navy and, and right after the war. I was born in 48, so that means he came to New Jersey and in 46. Were they married first, your yeah. parents, in uh, Scranton? Yeah. or yeah, They were married in Scranton and then, you know, moved and I was the firstborn and had four children. So, you, But you told me you were born in Beth Israel, I think, uh, in hospital Newark. in Newark. In Newark. And yeah. then you moved where? To East Orange, New Jersey, in an apartment house. Uh, I wish I could dig up the pictures of us on the top of the apartment house. And then they bought their first house in Edison, New Jersey, uh, where he used a VA loan, and they were building track houses there. And then subsequent to that, moved to Maplewood, New Jersey. So now in Maplewood, New Jersey, you said to me, you really, you enjoyed yourself, okay? Absolutely. How did you become a caddy at a young age? Well, I used to play mostly baseball, football, all sorts of sports. Maplewood is, is a town that has lots of park areas and great summer programs. Uh, but this Maplewood Country Club was right across the street from the, uh, uh, the baseball fields. And after I uh, struck out too many times in... Uh, the, but you were a good basketball player, you said. A good. I was on the you, basketball in high school. Good was relative. I certainly was uh, a lot faster and thinner at the time. Uh, but I did play. The star of the team was a fellow on TV all the time named Jim Delaney, who's the commissioner of the Big Ten. And uh, so we had a, a pretty good basketball team. But one day someone took me across the street to Maplewood Country Club, and I started both caddying every day, carrying one bag, then two bags, and then playing all the time at night, and they allowed you to play. So you started playing uh, golf when you were 12 or 13 12. years old. Yeah, so uh, really enjoyed it, and that was my avocation right through high school where I played but in high school. before we go to high school, yeah. you're in public school, you're having a good time, and what happens? Your dad says to you, you want to go to St. Benedict's? How did that happen? How did that happen? Not from asking me or seeking well, me. Was your mother uh, nah, enthusiastic I don't know. It's about hard, this? hard to say. We we're a Catholic family and fairly religious. And uh, St. Benedict's at that time was a very, uh, uh, and still is a very good school, but different. But it attracted a lot of suburban kids to come down to Newark. Um, I actually failed the entrance examination because emotionally I didn't want to go anywhere. I had all my friends and the best high school in the state at the time, Columbia High School, to go to were all my my brother and two sisters went to. I flunked the entrance examination. In those days, if uh, you gave the right contribution uh, on Sunday, the priest would make a call, and I got into uh, St. Benedict's Prep, and I was in the lowest class called F with the dummies, and then by the end of the semester, I had moved up to A after I perhaps overcame my uh, emotional reaction to, uh, to going there. My brother subsequently did the same thing, but he left very quickly, and my father let him off the hook. I enjoyed it, uh, and still a friend. But you continued also at that time working as a golf caddy? Yeah, as a caddy in the summertime, and I played on the golf team at St. Benedict's, and uh, so that was my, again, but, but sport. during this period of time, you said to me, your dad who worked for David T. Houston, Houston uh, who was a really large industrial broker, and you, your dad sounds like he because later on in junior year of college, which we'll talk about, you, your dad liked investing, your dad liked playing the ponies, you, your dad liked all this. You, you got into the real estate business. He took you to the office on Route 3 in Clifton, right? Well, I took me to the office on Saturdays in downtown Newark, and then when I got to college, uh, I used to go to the Houston office, and they'd drop me off on Route 3 in Clifton at the TikTok Diner, which is still there. Uh, and you'd go and canvas all these 5,000-square-foot 
tool and die shops in order to sell or lease or whatever. And I learned from that experience that being the intermediary, waiting for someone else to make a decision was not what I liked. Um, so even though I did it for a couple of years, I don't you know. You realized brokerage was. I realized brokerage is not for me, and that's probably one of the primary reasons I ended up with Chase Manhattan Bank as my first uh, job. Now, before we go to Chase Manhattan Bank, there's, you know, you're at St. Benedict's, good Catholic school. You could have gone to Boston College, could have gone to Villanova. You could have gone to a good Jesuit school or something. Right, right. Syracuse University? Uh, Syracuse, yeah. It was a little different choice, the only one from there that went. But they had a major in real estate. I knew I liked real estate. And they had a major in real estate. Temple University had a major in real estate, University of Florida. I actually had a partial golf scholarship to the University of Florida, and uh, but I chose to go to Syracuse because uh, I wanted to stay reasonably close to home, uh, and ended up being a tremendous experience and enjoying it. Now you said to me that during the summers you play, you worked at the golf course, making tips and making good income as a caddy, and then it's the junior year at Syracuse, and what happens? Well, I show up to register for classes, and I couldn't register. And what it turned out, my father went bankrupt. He had not harbored his money uh, very well. And so they put me to work in the bookstore, and I became a busboy working in uh, something called the Casanova Inn, which is still a well-known, fairly local restaurant. Now, and that's how and then took out some loans. Uh, now, you said your dad liked going to the ponies. One time he showed you the... I remember going to Yonkers Raceway, Raceway in 19... 19- 55, and him picking up a check for $17,500 um, at the racetrack. Uh, obviously, that you know that didn't last very long, but he liked the ponies, and he liked to play cards, okay? He wasn't, didn't, not, a, not in the typical sense, not an Irish drinker. He didn't like to drink very much, but he had these two avocations that uh, probably uh, where most of his commissions went to. We had four kids, but and we lived in a nice community, but eventually the bankruptcy and the foreclosure in the house uh, overall. But that's that's just... So you graduated Syracuse, and then you went to the... New Jersey National New Jersey Guard. New Jersey National Guard. Right. And you go to Fort Dix, and then where? Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And you were a chef, a I cook. Be, I, I, don't, I don't want to call you a chef. But I was a heavy equipment repairman when I went to Aberdeen Proving Grounds. When we came back then, when I was going in my once one weekend a month... I moved over to become a cook and then became the mess sergeant. You finished the Army Reserve. At this time, you and Sharon were married. You met, in, married you in met her in high school. Yeah, I met right. her in high school, yes. So uh, you married. You were living in New Providence, New Jersey. You were paying $110 a month. Right. Uh, what happened that you got the Chase Manhattan Bank? I truly forget what the contact was, but at that time, all the large banks, Chemical, Chase, Citibank, hired hundreds of young graduates a year and put them in their big management training programs. They were. What, what was your father and mother's thought of you going to, to work for a bank? Um, I don't think they had much influence uh, in it at all. Um, uh, my father liked it was in the real estate department, but, you know, my mother was busy still raising four kids. I was the oldest, so... Uh, so, so you go to Chase, in one Chase Manhattan Plaza downtown, but this was a time... We didn't have a bad recession yet, but we had some difficulties, and it was a great training town. And, 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 Absolutely. And, and it was a great training say- place. I mean, 71 through 73, I was truly in internal training, assisting lending officers. 74 is when the recession hit, especially in New York City, and all hell broke loose. Uh, I can truly state that every major owner, landlord, some of the biggest names, had difficulties from 1974 through probably the rest of the decade, uh, with even meeting their real estate taxes. It, it, New York was right on the edge. That's when you had the, the whole restructure. Uh, but it was a great way. You met a number of people, and as you said to me, uh, most of the bankers were older. That's right. And there were very few real young ones. And as I said earlier in the broadcast, uh, at 24, you made a vice president, which was a great accomplishment. And you spend eight years there, and you meet a number of people during the period of time. And then what happens? You're, you're like 29 years of age. You said, I'm going to get involved with a, a mortgage banking, or, you know, a company who's a correspondent to an insurance company? Well, for four years, I did workouts at Chase. And then for two to three years, I did 
new business in New York. And I did a lot of business with some of the biggest names like Rose and the Calicos and even Donald Trump, uh, uh, you know, on construction loans and things. Again, these were tough times uh, overall. Um, but I had a hankering to become an entrepreneur. Uh, I had no capital. In those days, you didn't have opportunity funds and things. So the best thing for me to do was to become an intermediary. And this company called New York Urban Servicing, which was formed in the 30s from the Depression, uh, an opportunity to buy into that was there, represented John Hancock, Equitable of Iowa, Penn Mutual, and some other life companies. Uh, and it was a very kind of entrepreneurial company, but representing institutional money. And some of the leading New York real estate people lent you the money, right? That's some of the leading real estate people lent myself $25,000 a piece to buy this company. And uh, uh, based upon the relationship I had with them at Chase, and uh, it turned out we paid that back uh, overall. But uh, the business the interest rates back in the early 80s exploded to 15, right. 20%. 15 to 20%. <clears throat> so so the business changed dramatically from becoming, you know, a correspondent for life companies. They did to turn into a brokerage company. And I decided that's, again, not what I wanted to do and went out and became a full-time entrepreneur. One of the things you did was you bought two buildings down in Florida. And did you and Sharon move down there? or you? Just well, she, we moved down there. I bought two buildings in Florida and I bought two buildings on Long Island. And then Sharon, who subsequently got an MBA and then went to work at Citibank and private banking division, she transferred to the real estate group. So she was running uh, a group that lent money to community developers in Florida. They transferred her to Tampa, Florida in 1982. Uh, and uh, I would commute back and forth managing these buildings on and leasing them up. And then the two buildings in Florida, uh, uh, which I thought was the greatest opportunity in the world, it turned out that Florida was very speculative. And uh, I ended up just selling those uh, overall. And in the case of the office building on Long Island, I'm still a 50% partner with Jeffrey File. The deal was done with his father, Louis File. Uh, but... Uh, been Jeffrey's partner there for a good number of years. Uh, so then you say, hey, I got a couple of buildings. It's something else I want to do. And how does this opportunity with Unicorp come in? Well, what happens is, one, I'm in Florida. Sharon's there with Citibank. But the fact is that there were very few opportunities for her to move ahead any place in Florida. Um, so we both decided. And I didn't think the speculation down there and risk was too high. So I said, let's move back to New York. She took a job in the shopping center group at Citibank, which was lending money to DeBartolo and Simon and people like that. And I, through a recruiter, got a job with this Canadian company. Uh, it was a New York, an American stock exchange in the U.S. They had a parent in Canada backed by, by the Bronfmans. And a fellow named George Mann was the uh, uh, primary mover. And he had very smartly purchased interest in seven REITs in the early 80s at very big discounts, put them all together in 85, and then hired me to run the properties and liquidate them. Um, and I did and that for And then he bought a bank. Then he bought the We made the $200 old. million dollars in uh, three years from, because he bought these REITs cheap, to, we sold 200 properties. And then he still, like all real estate guys. I want to be a bank. I want to be a bank. I want to be, see, I want to own a bank. You can, you know, you, and the answer is, it was at a time when all the savings banks had been recapitalized, you had, you know, again, you had uh, uh, East River get recapitalized, you had Apple Bank, Stanley Stoll, of course, Ravage had already done Bowery Savings Bank. You can name them. On, and really, it was at a time when uh, you had to pay the $200 million to buy into Lincoln Savings Bank, which was a $2 billion Brooklyn Bay sa Savings Brooklyn Bay. Bay Savings Bank. And it was the wrong timing. We closed that in early... 1989, and the FIREA Financial Recovery Act went into place in June of 1989 and changed all the accounting rules. So you put $200 million in of real money, not funny money, and then what you, you couldn't do anything with it. You had to go back to doing residential mm -hmm. loans. And also the recession was just starting again in New York City. And I was headed to lending operation, but 
I decided I didn't want to go do a workout at uh, yeah, Banks so again. What's in the next step? The next step was really uh, for two years, I recognized the opportunity uh, to do bids to buy pools of assets from SNLs, and I made four bids on RTC assets at the time. But nothing closed. But nothing closed. It was a time when capital was hard to raise. Uh, it was, it was uh, actually during those times, the best buying opportunity, I think, in my career. Anything that was affixed to the earth, you could have bought whatever price you paid, uh, you'd make money. You didn't have to add any value. And that's why the investment banks, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and others made a fortune buying these things overall. But that didn't work after two years. Um, and then my son at the time um, had a physical problem, and I didn't have any health insurance. So I took a job um, with Mutual Benefit Life, which had gone bankrupt in July of right, 1991. Right, but uh, Victor Palmieri, who Victor was, Palmieri was who, hired who, by the state of New Jersey. Right, who, uh, prior to that, took care of Grand Central. Uh, Grand Central, Penn Central. the Penn Central. And uh, they went bankrupt through a liquidity crisis through real, because of the real estate assets. They had $400 million invested in Fisher Island in Florida, $250 million invested in Williams Island in Florida. Didn't they also have investments in Broadway shows? I think Fantasy Broadway, the Opera. Yes, it is. They were in everything, and it was all hidden. You had something called statutory accounting in insurance companies. You didn't have gap. These were all off the balance sheet. The regulators couldn't believe it when they saw it. So I got hired to run to work for Victor Palmieri and to run that workout for four years. We hired 200 people. So you went back to Newark now? Back to Newark. Back, back, to, to, back to the roof. That was my other job uh, when I was offered at coming out of school. To go to work uh, for mutual to, benefit. To go to work for mutual benefit. So uh, it was a fascinating four years. Again, hiring 200 people. We had 100 joint ventures. We had a uh, $5 billion mortgage portfolio. They had to foreclose. We set up offices around the country. And it turned out in the end uh, that we got all the money back um, when they had predicted a billion dollar loss. So all the policyholders and all the GIC holders got their money. But in between, it was very hairy and uh, but fascinating from a management perspective and real estate perspective. And it, and it rounded more of your career. Up. Yeah, it, it, it really did. Uh, again, it was financially, uh, because it was owned by the state, they couldn't pay out, let's say, uh, incentives. Uh, but uh, for the management experience and the uh, uh, insights you gained, and I was able to use the workout skills uh, I gained in the 70s. So now there's another insurance company who says, I, I could use your advice. How does that come about? Well, I, they were the board members of Mutual Benefit were state people and then representatives from Prudential, MetLife, and others who were guaranteeing to the GIC holders uh, their debt if they would hang in there for six, seven years. And it turned out that one of the board members was a fellow named Rob Hendrickson, who ended up three years later becoming CEO of MetLife. He approached me to head up a subsidiary that they had started that was in White Plains, which was a third party investment management uh, subsidiary. And they needed to uh, add some people with broader skills. So now this was a company that they were buying properties? Uh, they were representing pension plans. They had an open-ended fund called the Tower Fund. They had several Japan, uh, Japanese-owned REITs that they had convinced uh, mutual life insurance companies from Japan to invest in, putting in general account assets. And they had a couple of separate accounts. So it was about a $600 million dollar company, which was small. Uh, they wanted to grow it. We were in White Plains, um, and I basically reorganized it, expanded it. We went from $600 million to $6 billion, uh, did a couple of acquisitions, uh, and it became a you know moderate size. But you were on the road now all the time. Well, the, your job as a CEO of an investment manager is uh, three things every week. One, you got to go out and try to raise money uh, and pitch. Two, you've got to prevent from being fired on accounts that you aren't performing. And then three, if you have a 1,000 people working for you, you've got management problems. So that was a constant now you were, seven you, or eight you years. Now, you Sharon at this time were living in New Jersey. We are living in New Jersey, Summit, New Jersey, where we had and ended up living. And you, and you were traveling to White Plains and traveling all around. Right. Uh, so the White Plains thing uh, was a little bit long, but it was, it was fine. And we eventually moved to New Jersey before I left. Everyone thought it was because I 
wanted to do that, but I didn't because it meant you were closer to the parent company and subject to their uh, oversight more when you really needed to be independent. But it was a very enjoyable job. We grew it nicely. So what happens in 2003? or 2003, uh, well, MetLife at that point had gone public, and they had a new CEO by name Bob Ben Moshe. Everybody, I think, knows from MetLife and then subsequently the turnaround of AIG. Uh, and he was upending everything at MetLife as to what they were going to do and how they were going to do it. So he basically made it pretty clear the company we were reporting to in Boston was not performing well. It was a stock and bond company. So I had a pretty good sense that they were going to sell us along with them to somebody. Uh, and I got a call one day uh, to uh, interview for a job um, on the City Investment Fund, where I've been for 12 years, 13 years. We uh, bought the, a number of assets in the city of New right. York. Uh, they had a, money was already raised. Morgan Stanley and Fisher Brothers were the partners. They only had clients and real estate in New York, so they didn't have to travel like they had done for so long. And we went in starting in 2004. We invested in about 35 different joint ventures or yeah, direct office assets. buildings. You owned the hotel. Right. We Coney built, Island. Coney Island. A lot of multifamily. Uh, Self-storage, our, our edict was to invest in New York City. Uh, office buildings in Harlem. Office buildings in Harlem, office buildings on Lexington Avenue. We'd, we did business in, in joint venture with companies like SL Green, and then we did business with companies that at the point time were very small and medium-sized. Uh, Savannah Partners, which is now a significant, uh, was a good partner uh, on two or three t- uh, type of deals. So it was uh, kind of fascinating. And it's just that the recession hit. We'd made some profits, uh, fortunately, and we're not greedy in the early stages and banked some profits. So when the downturn hit, even though we had certainly difficulties, especially on the condominium side, selling them out, uh, we were able to do it. And, uh, and and if many of the funds who didn't make any money during the period of time, at least you were positive. Uh, we're going to return the capital plus a few points and that in uh, 2004 funds. So let's talk about good. Sharon and uh, your son and daughter. Tell me about them. Well, Sharon and I met in high school. In, uh, she went to a Catholic high school in East Orange that subsequently closed. She went to Rutgers, right? And she went to Rutgers, Newark. At that point, 1967, women were not allowed at the state university. So she couldn't go to Rutgers in the New Brunswick. New Brunswick. But she couldn't afford it anyway. And her father, her father had died when she was six. Later. So she went to Rutgers undergrad, took a bus every day down to Newark. Graduated uh, from there and took a job as a uh, 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 insurance person doing claims with uh, Liberty Mutual uh, Insurance Company in East Orange. Uh, then we encouraged her to go back to school. She went to Rutgers North and got an MBA in 1975. Then got hired by uh, Citibank. by Citibank and private banking division for several years. And then subsequent to me leaving Chase, she transferred to real estate. And, Let's talk uh, about your son and daughter. Well, my son, he was born in Tampa, Jason, yeah. He pretty much was local. They both went to Fairfield University. Your daughter's and name is? Jessica, and she was born in 1988. And uh, Jason caught the real estate bug, and he's at CIT working for Matt Galligan, right. who's a fellow who I worked with years ago, and he's a and director. And Jessica? And Jessica, she's going to be a registered nurse in the next couple months. She lives in Hoboken, and... Uh, we live in New Jersey, uh, but we're hoping to spend more time in Florida over the next uh, couple of years as I liquidate this so, fund. So, so the, the golf caddy continues to play golf all over the world, enjoys himself, and has really become a, one of the deans of real estate and a good friend. Thanks for being here today. Thank you.